remember what to talk about because I've been watching you guys, the, the men that have been preaching, and I mean, you guys are doing a good job. I, I see the soul winning tips that you guys do, and, and I wasn't sure what, uh, what I can add to what you guys are already doing. Let's see how high this thing will go. It's a little bit better. All right. Um, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter number 14. And thank you for having me here at Revival Baptist Church. This is a really cool church, really cool people. And I'm excited to be here. I'm excited for tonight. And it was good preaching last night. And what I want to talk about today is uh, the title of this tip is called Compelling, Questioning, and Confirming. Compelling, Questioning, and Confirming. And there's different steps to your soul winning presentation and everybody has uh, a little bit different soul winning presentation if you will a modified Romans road and and I'm not such a stickler that I say you have to do it my way in fact the pastor says do it my way do it his way he's in charge but you know I think there's there's certain areas in your presentation that are going to be a little bit different right. than other people and that's the benefit from going out with different people is that you get to learn from one another so don't ever get caught up with I always go with this is my partner I always go with the same partner do yourself a favor, go with some strangers. Even if, even, you know, there are people that are not as good as you that you can learn from. In fact, this soul winning tip came from going with somebody that wanted, hey, come with me, I want you to see my presentation, help me out, you know, and he didn't even get to give a full presentation, but just some things that happened caused me to, it triggered in my mind, because I knew this would be happening, I thought, I, I know what I'm, I know what we'll be talking about in Orlando now. Um, you're in Luke chapter 14, I want you to find verse number 16. Verse number 16, it says, Then said he unto them, unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke and of ox, and I go to prove them, I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said unto his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, listen, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. He's saying, hey, go get them, right? Jesus is teaching us a lesson here. He wants the churches to be filled. He wants us to go get them. And he's saying, go compel them. Listen, compel is like an action word. It's like, go ye therefore, right? Go. Get moving. And a lot of times in our, in our soul winning, we don't use our time as wisely as we ought to. Listen, your time is probably the most valuable thing that you have. You've only got so much money. You've only got so much resources. Your time is limited and you're losing it every minute. You don't know when your time is up. You cannot get your time back. You can get your money back. You can get your stuff back, right? Even Job, he got, his, he got family members back. But time is limited, and you must value your time, especially when you go out soul winning. This is very important. And you have to walk away from excuses. You notice what happens in this story here. They began to make excuse, right? Oh, oh this ground. I've got some ground, right? It's like, well, I've got to mow this ground this morning. I know it's Saturday morning. I've got to mow this ground. I'm more worried about mowing the ground, right? I've got these, these five oxen to prove. Well, I've got some steaks on the grill. I had a guy one time, and he said... <laughs> Well, we've got meat on the grill. I just don't have time for this. Okay, sir. Well, if you don't, you know, if I can just tell you this, let me leave you this. So I kept talking and he's kind of listening. And then it got right back down to basically me saying, you're not saved. I told you, I've, I've got brisket on the grill. I'm like, brisket? Is that like a, two minutes and it burns? Oh, you know, that's like 12 hours, you know. So people will make excuses. They're going to make excuses about their ground, about their oxen, about their wife. Oh, no, no, no. My wife's Catholic. Okay, what about you? No, we, we, uh, we have a religion. Yeah, well, so what? <laughs> Where are you going to hang you know, When you die, you're going to go to hell if you're not saved, right? We have to go and find the people that are willing. And there are people that will make excuses. And there are people that will waste your time. 
And you know, a lot of times you go out soul winning and you get you hit these dry spells. Has anybody been through a dry spell? Yeah. And you're like, man, it's been miserable. It's been weeks. You know, I've been through one recently and I was with Brother Kyle and he helped me break that dry spell, you know? And you know, it's like, you do, oh, woe is me. You know, is there some unconfessed sin in my life I need to deal with? You know, you start looking around, well, I bet it was my partner. It's my partner's fault, you know? <laughs> but really, it can, you know, this is just life. Life is a roller coaster. You have ups and downs and we need to be consistent through it all. Right. In season, out of season, you should be a soul winner. And don't just be a, a clock puncher. But your time is valuable. And, and a lot of times people will come back, well, I haven't talked to anybody in weeks, and it was raining, and this guy would talk to me. I thought it was a waste of time. I spent 45 minutes, they didn't get saved. Well, guess what? It was a waste of time. Hey, that's the neighbor that was going to keep you from the guy next door that might have got saved. Listen, we still, I don't care if you've had a dry spell, you haven't talked to anybody all day. When you've got somebody you know that's making excuses and wasting your time, you need to walk away. If you, if you don't think you can compel them initially, what's going to change in 40 minutes? Right. Nothing, right? You're going to get wore out. You're going to, you're going to need some water. Notice there that he says in verse 21, he says, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city. Go out quickly. Listen, when it's time to go soul winning, you need to set the pace, right? right? You need to drink an extra cup of coffee before you get to the church. When you get to the church, as much as we were just talking about how much we love the fellowship, we love to get together and catch up with people. There's folks here, I haven't seen y'all in a while, and it's good to hang out and talk, but you know what? Today is the day for soul winning. Now listen, when I'm done, if you don't have a partner, get your partner, get out the door, get on the road, don't waste any time, get organized. And you guys have a cool system, I wanna see how this works today. I'm, I'm very interested in this, I've never seen this system. But I have noticed that a lot of these soul winning marathons, there's this lull of, well, we're going for two hours, but, 20 minutes was burned up here yeah. just trying to get together. Listen, guys, get a move on. Set the pace for the day. Amen. The fellowship Amen. happens in between the door. Amen. And something you need to realize, you know, as you pair up is that sometimes it's, you know, you may say, well, I want to go with my friend or I want to go with the, the pastor or I want to go with the special visitor or something like that. But, you know, you're, you need to pay attention to your leaders and the needs of your weaker brethren. Listen, there are people that need to learn the gospel. They need to hear your presentation. You might be that guy. You might be that lady that says, well, I'm, I'm at, you know, 50%. I could be at 100 or, you know, I mean, just be honest with yourself. Is there something you can learn? Would you be willing to break apart from the pair that you really want to go with and go with somebody else to learn something? And listen, if you're, if you're captaining soul winning and you're putting people together, you need to evaluate your soul winners and say, well, this guy has a good presentation. This guy needs to learn. Let's put these two together. I'm not going to send two newbies together. They're going to waste each other's time. They're going to be stumbling over each other. Hey, you know, I, well, I'm going to send you and your wife along with the newbie. I know you want to go with your wife and you're a good soul winner, so we're going to pair you guys together. So consider that in that you need to be prepared to learn. You need to be prepared to repair up depending on, on where your leader puts you together. Listen, we, we are like the missionary militia, right? It's a volunteer army. Nobody's paid to be here today. We're here to do God's work, and we're going to go out and get some souls saved. Listen, Orlando is under attack by magic and witchcraft and all manner of sorcery, and the only thing that will break people free is the Word of God. It's the gospel, and that's our job. We're here, hey, reporting for duty. How can I help, sir? Willing to go wherever. Okay, I want to pair you with so-and-so. Oh, not that guy. Yeah, that guy, go. You know? In fact, if you have a problem with somebody in the room, swallow your pride, go to them and say, hey, can I be your partner? All right, come on. We're supposed to love each other. We're supposed to demonstrate that love, and we need to change up so that we can teach and we can learn, so that we can help each other, and really, you're going to help yourself. Listen, I learn from new soul winners. I learn every time I go soul winning, and it's not that I change my presentation every time. Sometimes you hear how people handle a situation, how they respond to something, and, and you can learn, you can just kind of file it away. It might be something you want to do. You know, the Bible says compelling, right? This is the reason we go, is compelling. In 2 Corinthians 5, he says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Do you know what the terror of the Lord is? Fire and brimstone, everlasting fire, it's called hell. It is forever. That is terrible. It's true. It's real. It's a promise. And knowing that terror, we persuade men. I want to persuade you to change your mind, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, 
to obey the gospel. That's our goal here. It's not just going to have fellowship. It's not just here for breakfast. So listen, we're compelled to go. We don't need to be a selfish, selfish soul winner. We need to, you know, oh, but it's hot out today. So what? It's hotter in hell. Right. Thank God you don't have to go, right? You don't deserve the breath that's in your lungs. Why don't you go share the gospel with somebody? I don't care if you're uncomfortable or displaced. You know, we're the missionary militia. We got to go get these people. And listen, don't ever be embarrassed to say we need to learn more. We were talking about this last night. When I moved to Fort Worth, and, you know, I grew up IFB. I grew up, my dad ran a bus, and, you know, I, I was getting people saved when I was 11 years old, preaching the gospel. And, but when I moved to Fort Worth, Texas, to Steadfast Baptist Church, I was silent. I said, you know what? I've been arguing with people about, oh, you're a Catholic, are you? Oh, let me tell you about Mary. You know, I mean, I, was, I, was, I had the wrong approach. I had all this knowledge about religion, and it was getting in the way of my soul winning presentation. Now, that's good on the back end. That's a good bullet to have, but that's not how you start. You know what I mean? We're not out there to fight. You don't want to start firing rounds if you don't have to. You know what I mean? But, but um, so I was a silent partner, and I just shut my mouth, and I listened, and I went with some of the most faithful soul winners. And I'm just like, okay, that was really good. Then I go again, I'm like, Okay, it was the same as last time. Next week, same thing. Man, it was the same as last time. Okay, all right. Consistency. The same things. It's very important to make sure you're covering the basic points. And listen, your soul winning presentation should not just be some big eloquent ride. Let me tell you a big story. No, hey, look, it's very simple. Right? right? The gospel right. is simple. Do not overcomplicate it. I want you guys to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And listen, sometimes we're going to be displaced or out of our comfort zone as we go out in here and it's like well we got to hurry and go but hey can i ride with you oh ride with me well my front seat my car oh you're my, i've got kids it's a hey i don't care i'll ride on the roof let's go save some souls you know what i mean put me in the back of the truck let's go save some souls don't worry about the physical so much keep focused on the spiritual you know in romans 1 he says so as, so as much as in me is i am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in rome also are you ready to preach the gospel here in Rome this morning, right? Here in Orlando, are you ready to go and talk? You know, you need to compel yourself first. You need to persuade yourself, get up and go, be early. You got to be sincere. We got to get a move on. You got to be ready. Like I said, you got to really set your pace. You think about it. If you wake up and drink coffee, and for me, I'm a coffee drinker. I got to have a pot first thing in the morning, you know what I mean? And that sets the pace for the day. I get up and I get going. And soul winning is kind of the same way. That's why the Jehovah's Witnesses, right, they mosey into their little fake temple, you know. They sit around and they watch a, a slideshow. Then they go, oh, let's look up so-and-so. Let's go knock on their door. And they mosey over. Like, so we're not here to mosey. We're here not to waste our time. Our time is valuable. We are compelled to go, and we are compelling others to be saved. Now, what I'm teaching is compelling, questioning, and confirming. You're in 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse number one. We know these verses. This is the gospel, right? Look what he says here. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now listen, he's not saying here there are people that would lose their salvation. He says you are saved. Well, what's the conditional here? If you are saved, if you really did believe it. There are people, look at what it says here, that will believe in vain because they do not keep it into memory. There are people that believe falsely. They go along to get along. And if you come back tomorrow, they don't know what, they'll, they'll give you the wrong answer. But, it's, it, but, you know, listen, we are surrounded in a public school mentality of I, I studied the homework. I'm ready for the test in the morning. I got all the answers right. And by the weekend, I've totally forgotten what I learned. Yeah. Why? You didn't actually learn anything, yeah. right? We have to question all throughout our presentation. This should be a dialogue. This should be a sincere conversation from person to person. You need to sincerely be interested in who they are, what their name is, what's going on in their life. And look, don't let those things become the distraction. You are there to preach the gospel, right? right? And even if you forget to ask for their name, in the middle of it, just stop and say, what was your name? I'm sorry, I'm Adam. What was your name again? you got to get their name. you got to make it personal. And it's, it shouldn't be something insincere. There are people that will, that, that the Bible says, are a forgetful hearer. You will preach something. And it's funny, I had somebody, I won't throw him under the bus. I won't say Joe's name, but I, I was preaching. Oh, he's not here. I can get him. Okay. 
So I used a verse. I'm preaching. I'm done. And Joe comes up. Brother Joe's like, dude, man, I got this verse for you. You're going to love this. Look at that. And I'm like, yeah, that, that's the one I read. What are you talking about? Right? I was talking with Pastor Jimenez during his Red Hot Preaching Conference. And there was some information he gave out. Okay, tomorrow morning we're going to be back here at, whoa, 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 right? I got, wait, what time was that? I can't remember. I had to look it up and I'm trying to figure out. I said, you know, Pastor Jimenez, it's like, it's like, you know, when you're in the crowd, you miss stuff. There's distractions. Children are always, there's something going on. You're, you get distracted by reading a verse while they're still talking. And he's like, I know, it's almost like you, you assume that people are hanging on your every word. Mm -hmm. Guess what? It's not true, right? That's why some pastors and preachers just repeat themselves over and over and over to drive a point home. That's why you hear the same topic sometimes. Well, out, out soul winning, it's kind of the same way. You're going to keep mentioning the fact that it's a free gift, right. that it's everlasting life. My favorite, how long does everlasting life last for? Forever. I gave you the first word of the answer. You know, I want to help you get the answer, but I'm not going to trick you with my questions, right. and I'm not just going to give you the answer. Yeah. Well, you believe that, right? Okay, good. Let's move on. No. Believe what? I mean, if you go, yeah, 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 people will nod their head and say, yeah, what? I mean, think about it. People will follow your body language, and if you lead them into a yes, they will say a yes. But if you ask them a pointed question to find out whether they're actually paying attention, then you'll know what they believe, whether they're paying attention, whether they hear it or not. And if you find somebody you're preaching to, and after three or four questions, every time it's, wait, what? Wait, what? You know, right. do, are you awake? Do you even want to hear this? Yes. No, not right now. Okay, cool. Here's a YouTube card right there. It says, Bible way to heaven. Have a great day. And move on down the road. Know when to, to walk away. But there's a warning here about those that seem to get it, but they don't actually believe. He says, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. He's warning that there, there are people that are unsaved that are like, yeah, okay, I believe that. But then if you test them, they would totally have a different answer. Has anybody ever had it where somebody... They think they're a Christian. They're not saved. They're trusting in their works. They think they can lose it, but they don't have time. I don't want to hear it. Thank you for doing this. Right. You guys are doing a good job. It's like, you're unsaved. You're not even saved, and you're thanking me for trying to get people, you know, like, how, this is bizarro world. You know, but those people, I mean, they're, what they're saying is, I believe in you. I want you to think about this. He's warning us about those that would believe in vain. Oh, I believe in what you're doing. Yeah, but you don't believe in what I'm teaching. Right. Right. This is important. You're going to go to hell because you don't believe the gospel. Oh, but I believe in you. You guys keep up the good work. Yeah, but you don't believe the gospel. And you find that out by asking questions. So there are people that will seem to believe, oh, this is great that you guys are doing this. Oh, don't ask about my salvation, though. You know what I mean? Look at verse number three. Let's pick up where we left off. He says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Listen, this is very simple. What do you have to believe to go to heaven? That right there. It calls it the gospel. It says you are saved. These two verses, it gives you the three points. Jesus died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again. Boom, it's done. Very simple, but these are very complicated things. Notice he says Christ. Well, who is Christ? Is that just some guy? Was that a good prophet? Was that a man that became God as an ascended master? No, this is God in the flesh. Christ is the Messiah. The Messiah is the promise of God coming down to be with us. Jesus is Christ. He is God. He is the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. And if you leave out the fact that Jesus is God in your soul winning presentation, you failed. Right, yeah. You've totally failed. Yeah. If, you, if you say, I mean, you believe Jesus is God, right? Okay, good. Let's keep moving on. Wrong. Stop. Don't do that. That's a fail. Well, tell me about Jesus. What do you know? Uh, he, was a, he had disciples. Okay, keep going. What else? Uh, if you can't get anything out of him, ask him pointed. Do you believe that Jesus is God? Well, he's the son of God. He's the son of God. Hey, that's a good answer. That's true. That's part of the Trinity, you know. But guess what? By being the son of God, that makes him God. And you better teach the clear doctrine that he is God. Now, personally, I, I use Acts 7 where it says calling upon God, you know, saying Lord Jesus. I said, but what name did he call God? And I point at it and I let them read it. What name? 
uh, Jesus. Okay, good. Then I quote to him 1 John 5, 7, and then I like to show him uh, Revelation 1, verse 6, he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Did you know God had a Father? And nine out of ten times they'll say, God the Father, oh yeah, see, God the Son. And I'm already, and this is just how I've always done it, even before the Trinity controversy, because I, the Trinity just makes sense. We're made in His image, right? First Thessalonians 5 says we have a body, a soul, and a spirit, right? So guess what? There's a Father, there's a Son, and there's a Spirit. And most people get that. I mean, most people understand the Trinity, and by teaching the Trinity, you are essentially teaching that Jesus is God. So, and I know there's other ways to do it. In fact, we have... Um, we have these little printouts that we use. There's several. I've got different versions of them. I think I got a newer one. Yeah. Um, we have these stickers that we use. It's like a little cheat sheet. And, you know, for the Godhead, for the fact that he's the creator. And it's just good flows of verses. Some people prefer to use uh, John chapter 1 and actually show 1 John 5, 7. Whatever you do is okay as long as you're doing it. As long as you make sure that they understand. Because I, I just pointedly ask them, now do you see, according to the Bible, that Jesus is God? Do you see it? I mean, I make them say, Jesus is the name of God. I make them, uh, so I, I teach the doctrine of Jesus being God, because here when he says, Christ died for our sins, if you just kind of bump through that, and you just, you're just flowing through, well, Jesus, you know, you know Jesus, everybody knows about Jesus, but you're assuming that they understand that he is the God, the creator, the savior, you're missing some very Im important parts, that somebody might actually believe in vain. I've actually seen presentations where people have omitted it and then you step in and they're like, well, no, I don't think he's God. Well, no wonder they wouldn't pray with you. They don't understand the gospel. They don't understand why God even had to come down to the earth. They don't understand the remission of sins. I mean, there's, there's major chunks missing there. The next part there, he says, Christ died for our sins. I, one time, a long time ago, I, I, I'm presenting the gospel to this lady and it was a hectic situation with children and dogs and she's at the door and she's trying to you know, so it was, it was a little bit hectic. I didn't, it wasn't as perfect of, as a presentation as I would have liked. So I hurried. I missed some points. I get to the end. I'm praying. I deserve hell. I don't believe that. They stopped praying. I don't believe that. Whoa, I failed. I failed. Christ died for whose sins? Our, Our sins. Oh, well, my sins deserve hell? Whoa, you have to teach this. This is so important. And uh, there are different people that use it different ways. Personally, I'll use um, Ro uh, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. I've already defined sin as breaking God's law. I show them wages as something you earn, like minimum wage, or we get an hourly wage. People can connect to that. I don't just ask them, do you know what wages are? Because I found a lot of people think you're saying wager. Well, I like to bet. No, like, min you know what minimum wage? Yeah, I know minimum wage. Everybody knows that. So you earn, because of your sin, you've earned something. The Bible says death, right? Now, most people go straight to the second death, which is where I'm heading. Personally, I like to ask myself, you know, there's something about you that will last forever, and I can't see it. Do you know what it is? And most people get this right. They'll either say their soul or their spirit. I believe both are the right answer. I believe both your soul and your spirit will spend eternity. And I tell them that, yes, that's right. Your soul and your spirit will spend eternity in heaven or hell. And then I moved, I said, do you know the Bible teaches a second death, right? And then I moved to Revelation. I show them, I said, death and hell. And I really emphasize death and hell. Death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. So according to the Bible, what is the second death? And I point to death and hell. I make them read it. And they'll say, well, hell. Or if they say like this, I want them to say hell. I want this word to come out of their mouth. I'm not afraid of the word. I'm not trying to offend them, but this is a reality that because if I don't get it here, it's harder to get it in the next minute. When I bring it full circle back to them, do you deserve hell? What are the punishment for our sins according to the Bible? Death and hell. I get them to acknowledge it here. Look, I got them to acknowledge it in Romans 6. I'm getting it here. I move on down. And, you know, Revelation 21, 1-8, I'll say, here's a list of some things that people deserve to go to hell. And I go through and I, you know, depending on the person, I'll emphasize more or less on certain points. But I always do the same thing when I get to, you know, when I say murderers, I say, how many people have you killed this year? Right? And they laugh like, murder? What are you talking about? No, it's good to lighten them up because some people at this point in your presentation, they're just feeling like they're getting backed into a corner. And if you can lighten their heart a little bit, listen, it's not, it's not a show and games, it's not about jokes, but I, you know, I, I do want to lighten the mood a little bit and, and draw them in and help them learn. 
Well, no, no, you sure? You kind of look like a tough guy. You know, you know, I always joke with him a little bit. But then I move forward and I said, but of course, murderers, they deserve to go to hell, right? Nine out of ten people, yes. The murderers deserve to go to hell. And then you get down to I say, and look at this, and all liars. Uh-oh. Have you ever told a lie? Well, yeah, everyone has. Yeah, me too. Look what it says. All liars right. shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So according to the Bible, even if you're not a murderer, but you are a liar, what do you deserve? And if they've been paying attention, most of them will either say death and hell or they'll just say hell. Either one's acceptable. If they just say hell, I say, yeah, death and hell. I reiterate that because personally I, I teach that Jesus died and went to hell for our sins. He didn't just die for our sins. He went to hell for our sins. That's very important. So I ask questions all the way throughout to make sure that they're mentally chewing on this, that they, what their answers spit back out to me tells me whether or not they're paying attention. And just those few verses, is Jesus God? Do you deserve hell? If you're not getting, if you're just getting a yes, they might be believing in vain. They might be a forgetful hearer. They're going along to get along. And if you get to the end of your presentation and ask a summary, what do you think you have to do? Uh, be a good person. If you're getting that in your presentation, you need to slow down and ask questions at different points. And again, everybody's presentation is different. It's good. A friend of mine gave the advice. He said, what you should do, you know you're going to go to Romans 6. You know you're going to go to Revelation 20. He said, so, so that's already in your script. What, he said, what you should do is write the things you say in between the verses. And what you're doing, this is a good exercise because if you just blank sheet of paper, well, I know I'm going to this verse, just write, you don't even write the verse out, just write the verse reference and then write down what you typically say. And what you're doing is sort of self-analyzing where you're at, what you're saying, and listen, add questions. Add these questions, compelling, questioning, and confirming. I want you guys to go to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. If somebody does not believe that Jesus is God, if they don't believe that they deserve hell for their sins, it's gonna, you're going to have a hard time really getting them saved. They're going to have a hard time really believing on Jesus Christ as their Savior because they don't understand the big picture. And there is time to fit all of this into your presentation. It shouldn't just be a one, two, three, repeat after me. And I know that, I mean, you're here, so I know that that's, you're, you don't want to just be one, two, three, repeat after me, right? And guess what? There's a number four. And guess what? There's questions in between there, right? There's all these things, and you should get their name. You should find out a little bit about them. You know, if there's children, ask about the children. What's, that's not awkward, you know? Hold on, I'm really busy. I got to, oh, okay, is there a better time? Can I come back? You know, I mean, just stop and talk to the people like a real person, as if you just moved in next door and you want to be their friend. Because the next step is discipleship, and you'll never get there if you start out like a robot. If you start out impersonal, just informal, I, I just have to ask these questions. I just, no, hey, you're a person. You're a human being, and so are they. Connect with them heart to heart. But again, it's not about wasting your time figuring out what they do in life and all that, you know. In uh, Hebrews chapter 2, he says, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. We that are saved need to listen, take heed, because we're going to let doctrine slip. All of us in here are guilty of having something that we knew that we've sort of forgotten about. And, you, and that's why it's good even to listen to the fundamentals. I like listening to some of the other pastors. I'm like, that's, a, that's good. That's a good point. I forgot about that verse. Happens almost every time I listen to somebody else's preaching. I'm like, that's a good verse. I'm stealing that for this Sunday. You know? <laughs> I just finally finished my... You know. But no, it's, it's, it is good to pay attention to other preaching, but we need to take heed to our own doctrine. So we're compelling, we're questioning. And the last part we'll talk about is confirming. Confirming, which is the discipleship asset, aspect. You're in Acts 14. Look at verse number 21. It, verse 21, it says, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, listen to this, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. I'm here to exhort you as you guys grow and you disciple in this church, you will go through tribulation. Continue in the faith. Don't fall out. It's going to happen. I've seen it happen in our church. I've seen it happen in Fort Worth. I've seen people years past in other churches, great families, men of God, on fire. Where are they today? Sitting in their living room watching TV. They've given up. 
They traded their Bible in for a remote control, and it's sad. Listen, don't be one of those people, decide right now you're going to stay in this fight. But he says, confirming the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith. When you get somebody saved, it's your responsibility to then take them to the next level. You know, another way to look at it is go ahead and burn every bridge in their life, right? Oh, and by the way, everybody you know is unsaved and on their way to hell. Do you want to do something about it? Now, look, that's, a, that's kind of a, a rude way to approach it, but there are, there are nice ways to say that. Because you think about it, are, is there any, and thy house, right? Is there anybody in your house? Yeah. Are they saved? No. Get them out. Wake them up. Bring them on out. Let's deal with this. Look, you need to come to our church because when we have visitors, we preach the gospel. And I promise you, that if you bring one of your, fam your friends or family, we will show them these same scriptures and help them get saved. Because if they've really believed it, they got it, they're on oh man, that burden's gone, I know I'm going to heaven, right? They're excited, and they're like, but they don't, they're probably not ready to get somebody else saved. They're not equipped yet, they're not discipled yet. So hey, exhort them to come to church, exhort them to get involved. And, and I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. It's very important to confirm people after they're saved. Double check with them. Ask them some questions. Provoke them to become a disciple. I personally use uh, uh, Revelation 1, 3. Uh, blessed is he that readeth. There is a blessing for reading the Bible. Do you have a Bible? Go get your Bible. Let's look at your Bible. Is it a King James Bible? Emphasize, right? Blessed are they that read. There's a blessing. God will bless you if you read the Bible, right? And they that hear the words of this prophecy. Prophecy means to preach. God will bless you if you come to church, right? You can use Hebrews 10. There's a lot of different verses and ways to do this, but you're going to say you need to read your Bible, you need to come to church, and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Now that you're a child of God, you better obey because He does correct. He will correct you if you disobey Him. Because I always use the analogy of having a child, having a son. If they disobey you, do you kick them out of the family? No, you correct them because you love them. Well, God's the same way. He will correct you when you go live in sin intentionally against his word. And so it's very important to confirm. There's a guy, Alejandro, I believe was his name. Um, man, this guy, it was, it was really, a, this was some, some afternoon soul winning. Uh, the, the job I had at the time, I had a lot of free time. So I, I, went to, I, I picked out a neighborhood that wasn't on the regular soul winning map. And I said, I'm going to go in here, I'm going to get some people saved, and a lot of interesting experiences in that neighborhood, but this one guy in particular, and when I asked him, how many, how many people have you killed this year? This guy put me up against the wall, looking for a wire, I kid you not. This guy was part of a Mexican gang, this guy was a murderer, this guy was into sorcery, drugs, the whole nine yards, okay? I got the guy saved. He believed, right? He got it. He had the right answers. He's in tears. He wanted to make a... You know, I, and now in retrospect, I believe it was more of an emotional response. He started coming to church. He'd come to church every now and then on Wednesdays. Man, I had a Bible just for him. I, he showed up when I gave him his Bible. I was checking on the guy. I kept going back to his neighborhood. I'd knock on his door. I'd leave things on his door. I'm just praying for this guy. And then it was about a year later where our soul winning time had gotten out to that point in the map. And that was the neighborhood. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to, oh, oh, before that. So one time he came and another guy in the church tried to confirm him. You're 100% sure? No, man, I don't know. Or, you know. I don't know what happened, but this guy's telling me after the fact, man, that guy wasn't saved. I'm like, who are you? Like, what do you know? I got that guy saved. I've been praying for this guy. I gave him a Bible. How dare you say he's not saved? What's wrong with you? I'm thinking, this guy just doesn't know what he's talking about. This is a lesser soul winner, right? I was wrong. I had a bad attitude, you know, but that's the pro that's flesh, right? So I'm like, you know, I want to get to the bottom of this. We're in this neighborhood. I was the soul winning captain that day. Pastor Romero was with us. And I said, okay, Pastor Romero, you're on that side of the street. You're going down over there. And I knew what would happen. He'd hit that door because Pastor Romero knows the guy and remembers the guy, you know. So I asked him after him, like, so what happened with, the and I think it was Alejandro. I, I forget his, and that might be wrong. Doesn't matter. I'll never forget the guy, although I've forgotten his name. But what happened with him? He was like, man. Now when Pastor Romero, man, I'm like, uh-oh, right, what, what's going on? He said, so he's talking, how come you're not coming anymore? What's going on in your life? He says, I, Pastor Romero said, I think that guy is demon-possessed. I think he's a reprobate. What? I got him saved. Surely he didn't believe in vain. I tried confirming him. I gave him a Bible. He says, the guy would come to church, and this is his words, and the voices are telling me, don't listen to Donnie. Don't listen to Donnie. 
And he started giving more information about the cult that he was in, the gang that he was in, that if he got out, they would kill him. They had to kill people. They worship literally a, a, a skeleton, if you know anything about the Mexican uh, death religion. So it was really kind of a wake-up call for me in a sense. Like, you know, there are people that will say they believe that don't really believe. All they, if they really believe out of a pure heart, a true heart, a sincere heart, they're saved. It's done. Right. There are those that may believe in vain, and we can find out by asking questions by trying to confirm them. Look, you're in 1 Thessalonians 3. Look at verse number 2. And sent Timotheus, our brother, and ministers of God, and our fellow laborer of the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Right? And, you know, that guy that jumped in and tested him out, I should have looked at him like he's a brother trying to help establish and, you know, checking out his faith. You know, in retrospect, I'm thankful for the guy actually opening his mouth, even though at the time I took it personally, like, are you saying I'm not a good soul winner? Right. No, the guy's got devils. They're whispering in his ear. Don't listen to the preacher, right? Look at verse five in this chapter. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. He's like, I'm hearing bad news about you, so I sent him to check you out to find out for sure that you do have faith. You know, it may be he heard of bad works, but he wanted to check the faith, right? It is all about faith. And there are people that don't really be believe it, and they will shake loose over time. Do not be discouraged if you're trying to disciple somebody and, if, and you find out they didn't actually have faith. They didn't believe in one saved, always saved. They didn't believe in, in you know, the King James Bible or, or that Jesus was God. If that's happened to you and you had a bad disciple experience, move on. Just move on. After that happened with that guy, there was another young man I came across. And you know, I got him and his household saved and his neighbors saved. And they were coming to church and I was discipling them. And, and the Lord just used it like, hey, life is a roller coaster. You're going to have your ups and your downs. And you know, I just need to be faithful at all times through it but I'm responsible to make sure that I'm compelling them. I'm going out myself, I'm going quickly, I'm not wasting time. I'm using everything I can to persuade them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I have to question them throughout the process to make sure they truly understand what I'm teaching. I wanna hear it back out of their own words, out of their own mouth, and then confirm them. Once it's all done, take an extra two or three minutes to really provoke them unto love and to good works, right? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, right? Get them in church, get them on fire, get them a Bible. You know, we use the John and the Romans. I recommend, we have the, the, the New Testament gift Bibles and the John and Romans. I recommend to our soul winners that we pass those out and then we give them a coupon to come to church to get a Bible. Some of our soul winners carry a whole backpack of Bibles and give those away. And that's a good thing too. Every time I've been with one of those guys, it was perfect. They needed that Bible. So it's, you know, if you say, no, I'm, I'm doing bi whole Bibles, do it, you know. But personally, I like to try to, you know, well, let me get your information. I'm going to mail you a packet with some preaching and a coupon. You can come to church and get a free Bible. So that's, that's just my thoughts on that personally. But it is our job, compelling, questioning, and confirming. So this morning as we get ready to go, let's be in order. Let's do it quickly. Let's not lose our focus. We're not in this building to fellowship today. We're in this building to get paired up and go out and preach the gospel. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for what you're doing here in Orlando. Lord, this whole area needs you. Lord, the state of Florida needs you. And, and I thank you for the soul winners that you have here permanently and those that are visiting today. Lord, I pray you'd bless our time and give us the wisdom of words to be able to compel them to be saved. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the free gift of the gospel. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.